Please be seated. Good afternoon. Uh, we're ready to call uh, the case of Olympus v. William DeWolf Jr. Uh, counsel, are you prepared to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Please do so. My name is Eric Bonner, and I, along with my co-counsel, Ray Panneton, are representing the petitioner, the State of Olympus, in the case at par. He will be arguing the 8th and 14th Amendment points, and I will be taking up the 4th and 14th Amendment points. My argument consists of three main points. First, that the vehicle in question in this case falls under the vehicle exception because it meets the two standards set aside by this court for that exception in California v. Carney. Secondly, that the Cyclops 237 is a legitimate technological device that can be used by police officers without a warrant because it meets the two standards set aside by this court for the use of such a device in Kylo in the United States. And finally, that both the plain view exception from Katz and the open field exception from Oliver apply to the case at bar and show that Mr. William Dinnell did not establish his own subjective right to privacy and therefore should not, be deemed, should not have one be deemed societally reasonable. Unless Your Honors would like a brief resuscitation of the facts, I will begin with my case. Counsel, I actually have a question. Um, is mobility not a criteria for the ID field exception? Yes, it is, Your Honor. And how exactly was this vehicle mobile? This vehicle was 900 feet into a wooded area, and it did have four flat tires. However, those tires could easily have been aired up, and the vehicle driven off of the premises. It would not have taken very long, in fact, much less time than it would have taken the police officers to obtain a warrant for Mr. Denault to move the vehicle off of the premises. Well, wasn't one of the other issues in the Carney case that uh, the vehicle should have been licensed? Yes, Your Honor. However, they were applying for registration, but I would like to afford before this court that it doesn't take registration to drive a vehicle. People drive vehicles without proper registration tags all the time. It can still be readily mobile and the evidence can still drive away whether or not the vehicle has registration. The vehicle in question does meet both of those standards because the tires could be aired up long before they could obtain a warrant. Now say, if Denolf and his stepfather had taken the tires off the vehicle and put it up on cinder blocks, then it might be a residence. But because they did not do that, because the tires were simply flat, it does meet the standard for being readily mobile. It would be a bad precedent by this court to say that one who can simply drive their vehicle into the middle of a wooded area, flatten all the tires, and suddenly it has the Fourth Amendment protection of a residence. Now, so how long was the vehicle being observed? The vehicle was being observed for three months. And during those three months, was there any indication that there was any intent to make the vehicle move? There was not any indication that there was an attempt outside of them applying for registration tax, which does show intent that they did want to move it at some point. However, whether or not there was an intent to move it doesn't mean that the vehicle wasn't moved prior to it being observed, nor does it mean that it couldn't have moved at any moment during the observation process. My second point is that the Cyclops 237 is a justified technological device. This court ruled in Kylo v. United States that there are two standards that show us whether or not a device can be used without a warrant. The first standard is that it's in general public use. The second is that it does not show the intimate details of residence. How would you define general public use? General public use in this court, as it was defined in the Kylo case, is that the device must have public applicability. In Kylo of the United States, the heat sensor was ruled unconstitutional because it was used on a residence and this court found that it only had applicability for military, law enforcement, and scientific. However, the crucial difference to make between Kylo v. United States and the case at hand is that the Cyclops 237 has public applicability. It is used by bird watchers, it is available through magazines, and it would be used by them in wooded areas just like the one that Mr. Williams and Olf was found in. What are 
the infinite details of a home that nonetheless cannot be observed. Absolutely, Ron. In Kylo v. United States, this court ruled another reason that the heat sensor was unconstitutional was because it saw heat emanating through the walls. In other words, it saw something that the defendant in that case wished to not put in the public eye. However, in Katz v. United States, this court ruled that what one chooses to make available for the public to see is not under Fourth Amendment protection. Now, in Katz, that person chose not to allow anyone to listen to him by going into a phone booth and closing the door. The issue there was what was audible. The issue here, however, is what can be seen. And Mr. Williams and all chose to leave the window of his motorhome wide open. In doing so, he falls under the plain view exception, which means... But aren't the facts of the case that without leaving the side box, it was actually not plainly able to be seen by uh, someone just passing by? It could not be seen by someone just passing by, Your Honor. However, this court ruled in all over the United States that in order for one to extend their curtilage of their property out to its full boundary, they have to build a fence around it. <coughs> William Knoll chose not to do that. Therefore, the open field exception from that case also applies. Consequently, an officer could simply have walked onto the property, walked up to the recreational vehicle, looked through the window, and seen and saw see exactly what she saw with the Cyclops 237. So if you tint the windows, you're okay. The window was open. I know. If you tint the windows and that can't be seen, the court has never ruled about window tint. But he did not put curtains in front of his window, which would have been a guarantee that nobody would have, would have been able to see. If you put up blinds, if you pull on the cord so that the blinds <laughs> tilt and you can see partly inside, have you protected your subjective expectation of privacy? I'm not sure, Your Honor, and that would be a completely different case. It How it might be, but answering the question is going to let me figure out what your core principles are and to figure out whether or not adopting them is going to lead to a problem down the road. If, if the respondent did have blinds on his windows, and he had tilted them even slightly, then he would fall under at least some form of Fourth Amendment protection, most likely. But this court has never ruled on that. But what is evident counsel, is that... Counsel, if, uh, if there was an individual engaged in uh, bird watching from the public highway, um, would that individual have access to the Cyclops device through... Um, magazines for sportsmen, and could that individual see what was seen by the officers in the investigation? Yes, Your Honor, to both of those questions. They would have access to that device through specialty, specialty bird catalogs. They would also have access to that device through specialty military catalogs. And if they were watching birds from the public highway, they would have been able to see the same plant that the officer in question believed to be marijuana and used to obtain a warrant if they were in the same position as the officer was. So the device, which falls under the general public use guidelines, only saw what Mr. Williams and chose to make knowingly available for the public to see. But none of this matters if this court goes back to my previous point and rules this was in fact a vehicle that falls under the vehicle exception. But you can't just search a vehicle. But you had you can with probable cause, Your Honor. What probable cause was there here? In before this, you went in and before you saw the inside of the trailer with the side box. The probable cause in this case was that Denolf and his stepfather did have a primary residence that they spent most of their time. Through different anonymous witnesses and other evidence, they believed that there was illegal activity going on in this vehicle. So, the probable cause was that vehicle, which, if the vehicle exception is fully applied, is enough to search the vehicle. However, whether this court deems the vehicle exception to be applicable or not in this case isn't, doesn't matter, because in order for one to be under Fourth Amendment protection, they must first establish that Fourth Amendment protection. Mr. William Denault did not do that. Therefore, society can't deem it to be reasonable if he chose it never at one point to put curtains over his windows, never to fence off his property, and never to in any way attempt to hide himself from what was going on past that window. So, so if, he put, if he put a fence around the trailer with the four flat tires, you couldn't look into an open window with a cyclops? If he... If he had put a fence around the trailer mm -hmm. that was around the entire football field, Your Honor, or around just the trailer itself? You choose. <laughs> if it was just around the trailer itself, then the officer in question may have simply walked onto the open field, walked up to the fence line, and saw through the open window. Let's say the fence is three feet higher than the trailer. 
Then, and yet someone finds a tree that's higher than the fence, so the, the trajectory is lower, you can use a cyclops to look in. No, Your Honor, because this court has ruled it all over the United States that once a fence like that is erected, the, they have ex actually extended their Fourth Amendment curtilage beyond that. And if the window is not visible from just standing on the other side of the fence, not climbing a tree, then it is different. It would be a completely different case altogether. Doesn't that seem like a silly constitutional rule? It, it that, we're, that we're dealing with the length of a fence to figure out whether or not there's a constitutional protection. It, it does seem silly, Your Honor. However, it's not just the fence that's in question. What's also in question is the fact that Mr. William Hill chose to leave his window wide open. So, but it's, it's in a wooded area, a secluded area. There isn't, isn't the rule different than uh, a home within a neighborhood? Yes, it is, Your Honor. My time has expired. May I answer your question? Mm -hmm. It is a little different, Your Honor. However, not to the extent that the that William Denault did not establish his own Fourth Amendment privacy. So by driving into a wooded area, flattening the tires on his vehicle, rolling down the window, and assuming the trees count, is not the case. Mr. William Denault, by leaving his window open, by not fencing off his private property, chose to neglect establishing his own Fourth Amendment protection. Therefore, society cannot deem him to have that protection. And for these reasons, we ask this court to overturn the previous court's ruling and rule that there was no search that was unconstitutional. State of Olympus in the case of Barr, and I'm here today to demonstrate to this panel that the State of Olympus did not violate Mr. William Denault's protection of the 8th and 14th Amendment's protection against the punishment that was cruel and unusual for two reasons. First, that Proposition 417 was a legally enacted law by the people of the State of Olympus, and this court has ruled that states have the supreme discretion in determining punishment for offenders within their jurisdiction, as long as that punishment was is within the bounds of the Constitution of the United States. And secondly, the way that Proposition 417 is crafted and applied in the case of Barr, there is no constitutional violation. This court ruled in Ewing that, that states have the discretion of punishing the offenders within their jurisdiction within the bounds of the law. Proposition 417... That doesn't tell you much, though. What's that? That doesn't tell you much, though, because the whole question is what are the bounds of the law. Right. Well, the, so the, is there a proportionality? Requirements embodied in the Eighth Amendment? No, sir, you're not. This court, there is no. So if the, if the state decides that littering is really a big problem and the only way to prevent littering and deter it is to start cutting off people's hands, that's consistent with the Eighth Amendment? Uh, no, sir, Your Honor. Then there's a proportionality requirement in the Eighth Amendment, somehow, some way. Somehow, somewhere, yes, sir, found in Solemn v. Helm. This court ruled that. Um, alike offenders cannot be punished more harshly than, than another of the same crime. Okay. No, no, but let's assume, let's assume every state in the union decides that littering is a big problem, and we're going to start cutting people's hands off. Well, then this court should look to Justice Rehnquist's decision in Harmland v. Michigan, which states that cruel and unusual is, are not mutually exclusive terms. The punishment can be cruel as long as it's unusual. Counsel, if I could, if, if I could just, uh, the, the, the question is, is there a proportionality requirement in the Constitution? No, so there's not a strict proportionality guarantee in the Constitution. At no point, we're going to start, we now decide that cutting people's hands off is not sufficient to stop the huge problem of littering. So we're going to resort to capital punishment. Well, Your Honor, that's not there's an issue. There's no proportionality requirement? There's not a proportionality issue there so much as, as Justice Rehnquist defines in his a majority opinion in Harmony, Michigan, that a punishment can be cruel as, not, as long as the mode of punishment is not unusual. In the case, think, of, think of the easiest possible way to put a human being to death, where no pain is involved. Is there a violation? Absolutely, Your Honor. The mode of punishment in that case would, would define that punishment to be unconstitutional. No. Let's assume that you can give someone something that looks like a Tylenol pill. There's no pain, there's no torture, there's no asphyxiation. Two minutes after taking it, the person lapses into sleep and a minute later dies. You can give a person that pill to execute him or her for the offense of littering, and the Eighth Amendment will not be violated as long as every state in the Union sees it as a fit punishment. 
Well, that, that would be a violation of the evolving standard decency test. And furthermore, the Why, then there's a proportionality requirement. There, there isn't a, there's not a strict proportionality requirement. Then tell me how that's a violation. Well, the violation exists in the fact that a capital punishment was handed down for a non-capital offense. This right. court has ruled that cap Counsel, let, let, let's assume that it's not a capital punishment. Let's assume that you have a, an offender that has repeatedly violated um, the law and been convicted of nonviolent offenses. And that individual is sentenced to life without parole for a series three, four, five of nonviolent offenses. Would, that, would there be a proportionality requirement in that type of case? In the case that you just mentioned, Your Honor, no. Uh, this court ruled in Eddings that mitigating aggravating circumstances such as, in this case, a bar age, would only need to be taken into consideration in capital offenses. And that is because this court has ruled that capital punishment is, is unique in its nature in as much as it's irrevocable. There is nothing irrevocable about the punishment that's being Well, in, in this situation, because uh, this court has indeed ruled that minors can no longer receive uh, the death penalty, it is not life without parole the most severe punishment then that can be imposed upon a minor? Yes, ma'am, it is the most severe punishment that can be imposed upon a minor. However, then should we not look then at the proportionality requirement? Does the punishment fit the crime? Uh, no, Your Honor. When this court deemed that life in prison without the possibility of parole is an acceptable punishment for the crime of, for, for a minor, this court did not simply set aside that punishment for capital offenses. This court simply stated that that is an acceptable mean of punishing a minor, which is what the people of Olympus chose to do here. Counsel, let, let, let's assume that there is a proportionality requirement. How should we then, if, if we decide that there is a proportionality requirement, how should we analyze this? If this court were to assume there's a proportionality requirement built into the, to the uh, Eighth Amendment of the Constitution, the state of Olympus still has a case due to the fact that the heinous nature of the act of aggravated rape as defined by Proposition 417. Mr. William Denault brutally raped and sodomized a 15-year-old girl, and when the police found her, needed immediate medical attention. This is a very serious crime. Would, would your position be different if this were a, uh, a non-violent crime that he had been charged with? If this were a non-violent crime that he received life in prison without possibly parole, right. it, it would, that would be a completely different situation, Your Honor. And that, the facts of that case would need to be analyzed closely. However, in the case at bar, we see Mr. Denault was charged with aggravated rape of a 15-year-old, and it was a heinous act. And this popularly, popularly enacted piece of legislation defines the, the evolving standard decency test. Currently, 10 other states have laws on their books similar to this. The other 40 do not speak out against this law. They simply have not enacted such. When, when you say similar to this, what is similar? Uh, they have no age restrictions on. The